in verse 6, he says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, or I'm sorry, of the world, and not according to Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you once again for allowing us to gather together. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would give us a desire, Lord, a hunger, uh, Lord, just to know what your word says to us today, Lord, to, to reveal uh, your meaning of what you have to say to us so that as we walk out this life, as we do the things that we're going to do, or that we will see how that relates to you, or that we will see how our life is completely and wholly yours, Lord, and to live in a life that reflects that. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Okay, so in verse, verse 6, we, we had this, if you weren't here last week, uh, that's okay, <laughs> but uh, we spent the entire 35 minutes on verse 6. And I know it doesn't seem like a very, uh, very much words there, but it sets up this, this point that therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus as the Lord, now you walk in him. So as you have received Christ, now you walk that out. Now you walk, you live, you do everything that you do in him. It's not enough to have your name on the roll at the church. It's not enough to go to church. It's not enough to do churchy things. <coughs> He's not requesting entrance into some aspect of your week. He wants everything, all of it, 100%, nothing left over, all of your life is his. That is this term that we use when you receive Jesus as what? Lord. If you call someone Lord, you're not calling them that and then calling the shots as well. When we receive him as Lord, he is Lord of everything, all aspects, everything. So verse seven, he says, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. This idea that he wants us, you basically break it into three, three things, right? He wants us to be rooted, established, and abounding. Uh, now that sounds very, uh, <laughs> uh, what do you call that? Prosperity gospel. He wants you rooted, wants you established, and he wants you abounding. You know, that, that, you watch the preacher on the TV and he tells you all these things. That's not what we're talking about today. It's not. We are to be rooted in Christ, and what that means is that our root has been pulled from this world and placed into him. It's no longer here. When uh, in Ephesians uh, 2 verses 11 through 13 in Romans chapter 11 verses 11 through 24, you want to read those later. Uh, but he, he lays out, Paul lays out this story, this picture, this metaphor of the wild branches that we are being cut off from this world and grafted in to his family, to his orchard, to his people. He wants us to understand that it's not just that you have added Jesus into your life. It's not this that you've got some new church stuff. He says you're cut off from this world. You're rooted into him. He is everything. He is the source of your life. He is the source of your everything. Everything, everything. Uh, we were talking in, in youth this morning, um, and we're, we're kind of talking about this idea of, uh, in John chapter 15, he, you know, it's the whole verse is about abiding in him as the branch can't bear fruit without the vine. And I said, you know, if I went out to a tree of some sort, and I, I cut off a branch, and I took it into my house, and I was like, now I'm going to have apples or oranges or whatever, whenever I want them, just right there on my counter, I just have this branch right there ready to go. 
And you came over to my house and Dan came over and I'm like, hey Dan, check this out. I've got a orange branch in here. So whenever I want oranges, I just gotta wait. It's gonna grow them right there in my house. Isn't that cool? Ooh, what would you think? He like put his arm around me. Hey, I need to explain. I'm not a botanist, but let me just tell you, that's not gonna work. That won't work. There's no life. There's no root. There's no nourishment. He wants us to understand that in the same way, that is the way it is for us. That we are rooted in Jesus. He is the place where we find our everything. Now because of that, there's implications about every other aspect of our life. Everything. When you use a term like everything, it means what? Everything. Everything. So the place that we find our life can no longer be anything here. It can no longer be our job. It can no longer be our finances. It can no longer be our success. It can no longer be our family. It can no longer be our looks or lack thereof or whatever. It can no longer be anything here. It can no longer be our politics. It can't be any of it because our root is in Christ. In Christ alone. It says rooted and built up in him. It's this idea that we are now in Christ. We're rooted in him. And the growth that comes out of our life is him. What comes out of our life should reflect him. Now that is a, that's a challenging thought. Uh, I worked in inventory, I worked in warehousing, and uh, a lot over the years, I, I started, I worked to, for a company called UPS, you might have heard of them, um, and then I, I worked for, in this candy warehouse for a while, and I thought that was going to be super fun, because there's just candy all over the place. It's not fun to carry candy, like big boxes of candy around, it's just not. Uh, and then I, I worked for another company that did all groceries, and I, I just called that the grocery mine, because that's, that's what it was, you just went in there and you mined for groceries. But uh, one of the things I like about warehousing and inventory and all that is that you have a physical representation of what it is that you say you have in the building, <laughs> right? If I look on a computer screen and it says I have 7,000 boxes of macaroni and cheese and I go to that slot, how many boxes of macaroni and cheese are going to be there? This is going to be like 20,000. It's going to be off bad because inventory is terrible. But you know, it's going to be what it says should be there, right? The thing that it says should be there is going to be there. Or else what? You make changes, right? You adjust. You either go and find more macaroni and cheese and put in that slot, or you go to the computer and say, nope, that's not there. You make the two things add up and match. And oftentimes when we see something like this in Scripture, it's like we're going into the warehouse, the storehouse of our heart, and say, is this true? Am I rooted in Christ? Are the things that come out of my life of him? Or are they of me? Is he the God of every aspect? Is he the Lord of my life? Or am I? Because we both can't be. It doesn't work. We can't do it. And so the question that you have to start, or the premise, the very beginning of this is, if he says that we are rooted in him and we're being built up in him, is that true of you, of your life, of what you do? And I'm not trying to get into a legalistic thought of you've got to do in order to be. It's this idea that as we are, that's what comes out. It's just like when he talks about the, the branch and the vine, like it's just going to produce fruit because it is. That's what he wants out of us. He wants us to be in him, rooted in him, so that the fruit that's produced out of our life is coming from him. That's what this whole thing is about. It's not a do so that I'll be happy. It's a, I'm already happy in who you are, who I've made you to be. Now submit to me. Remember where your root is. Quit trying to go find other places to plug into. It says, rooted and built up 
in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught. This idea of being established. We are part of that. Like this systematic part of, uh, of the church, which is here, the, the body of Christ, the church, the, the Sunday school, the uh, discipleship training, the youth ministry, and the children's church, and all these different things. Like that is us establishing ourselves in Christ. That is us listening to and understanding what the Bible says so that we know it, so that we can live in it, so that we can follow it. We're established in this thing. Um, I've gone through different periods in my life in the church where I've been frustrated with the church. Uh, I'm sure some of you have been there as well. Uh, but there have been many times where I thought, you know, I'll just do it myself. I'll just go by myself be my own little church at home. You know, I can read the Bible. I can study. I can do it all by myself. I don't need this. That is such a fallacy. That's such a, a stupid thought, really. We need this. We need encouragement from one another. We need to be built up together. The fact of the matter is we cannot do this relationship with Christ without his church. It's not possible. Um, so as we look at this and he says, you're, you're rooted in Christ, you're rooted in him, being built up, you're established in this, you're learning, you're, you're figuring this out so that you understand and know what it is that he has for you to do. Just so that we understand one thing, I, I want to make very clear. Um, it's not a once and done thing. How many of you uh, took, let's say, geometry in uh, school, you know, high school, whatever, uh, or let's, let's go even more basic. Let's say, how many of you learned how to add in school? We all learned how to add. You know, that was one of the debates. They're like, here's ABCs and here's what one plus one is. Boom. When you learn how to add, it's a, it's a one-time thing, right? You know how to do it, and now you can just go for the rest of your life, and you see numbers Together, and he's like, okay, together they make that. It's a one-time thing that we don't really need any more with. This establishing, this building up in Christ is not a once and done thing. It is a continuous thing that you will do for the rest of your life. And if you ever get to the point where you feel like you've got it and you don't need it anymore, you probably need it the most. There are no superheroes in this. There are no super Christians, there are no ninja Christians, or however you need to think of it, that are, well, above and beyond and way up here. Guys, we need this, all of us, all of us need it every day, every week, as much as we can get it. We need to know him more and more. Not just facts about who he is, not just dates and stuff. We need to know him. We need to know him. So as you go throughout this, uh, make sure that you don't ever get to the point where you feel like you're full of it. Because the truth of the matter is you might be full of it. <laughs> um, so we've got rooted, we've got established, and now we've got uh, abounding in thanksgiving. Um, this life that we live in Christ is supposed to be one that is abounding. Uh, we, there are many people that will look at that and say that we should be abounding in things. Uh, you should just have a bunch of stuff and be abounding in Thanksgiving because you just got everything you want. I, I would like to tell you that I think the inverse is true. The, the flipping of that on the head is what is the truth. That in everything that we have, we are abounding in Thanksgiving over that. Does that mean you have to have a lot in order to be abounding in Thanksgiving? No. What did Paul say? So I've learned no matter what I'm in, whatever state I'm in, no matter what I'm going through, to what? I'll just be content. Remember, this wasn't being written by somebody today. This was being written by somebody who had most likely suffered very, very heavily for walking in Christ. Somebody who had probably gone through extreme difficulty to carry the gospel message forward. And when you can do that and say, abounding in faith, I mean, I'm sorry, abounding in thanksgiving, 
That means something. We are not supposed to be the people who are abounding in thanksgiving because we're just getting everything we want. Building up our little kingdom here. Heaping up stuff that is going to what? Rust and dust and moths and burn. I have a, uh, I have a, uh, maybe a different perspective on a lot of that. Uh, my house burned down when I was young. Uh, it actually burned twice. The first time it didn't affect me, it just burned part of the house. Second time, it actually started in the closet behind my room. Uh, the house was real old. Uh, some of the wiring was actually wrapped in burlap, so it had been smoldering for uh, years and years. It had There's this thing that happens when uh, wood smolders for so long, it's called uh, petrifies, basically. And so that had happened, but uh, we happened to be out of town that weekend. We went camping, <coughs> and it burned down uh, like a lot of the house, but my room specifically was like, you walked into it, and there was just nothing there. It was just a big black hole. <coughs> I didn't think about it too much at the time. I, I wasn't a Christian, and uh, you know, I've, I've come to think about it more and more over the years. But the fact that all of those things, all that stuff, all of those treasures that me as a uh, like eighth grade kid, you know, the baseball cards, the I had a giant starfish that I thought was like the coolest thing in the world, even though it smelled really terrible. Um, but uh, I had uh, drumsticks that my friend had given me from this concert, and like all these things, and I just thought, you know, wow. This is cool stuff. And it was just gone. That's what this life is. It's like we're, we're heaping stuff into a burning house. We're just building it up. And we're constantly putting new boards on it and trying to fix it up and slap another coat of paint on it while it's burning down. This is not the place to establish your treasure. This is not permanent. This is so momentary, transitory. We're we're pilgrims walking through this place. So when he says this idea of abounding in thanksgiving, it's not talking about, yeah, just get a bunch of stuff so you can be happy. It's talking about no matter what you're doing, and be thankful for that. Remember whose you are. Remember that Christ is enough. Remember where your root is. That is what brings us thankfulness. Because we know who our Redeemer is. Verse 8. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. So, real quick. He says, Don't be taken captive by... uh, Philosophy, empty deceit, uh, human tradition, or the elemental things, the elemental spirits of this world. Um, It's very interesting to me that he makes sure to hit us with this. Uh, One of the problems that was going on at this time was as the Christians uh, were in these different places, what had happened is that all the Jews had been kicked out of a lot of them. So Jewish Christians, Jewish people, it didn't matter. They were kicked out. Uh, but as they started to come back in, what they were bringing in was uh, like Judaizers, right? They were saying, in order to really be a Christian, you've got to be in this Jewish tradition as well. In order to really be part of the Christian faith, you got to know it's all about really being a Jew first. And so what Paul oftentimes is, is combating is that idea. And for us, like I, I don't think anybody's coming in here and being like, yeah, you know, you need to wear the little cap and you got to keep the festivals. Nobody's teaching us that these days, right? But we sure do like traditions. We sure do like the way that it used to be done. We sure do like the songs that we used to sing. We sure do like everything to be the way that it used to be. And that is not something that is only because of if you're older. Everybody does that. I'm, I'll be 37 next month. I do that. There are things that I want to be a certain way because that's the way I feel comfortable with it. 
We all have traditions. Traditions are not a bad thing. The problem comes in what he's saying when we're taken captive by those traditions. When we feel that we add tradition to what we do here. There is nothing about tradition that we add to Christ because it is so easy to veer away from Christ and to hang on to those traditions for all that we've got. It's interesting to me that he warns us of this. And it's not the only place he warns us, but he hits us with it quite a bit. But he says, don't be taken captive by uh, the philosophy of this world. And you're just going to break it down to the very bare uh, bones of what he's trying to say. He's saying, don't listen to what the world says is wise. Don't take the wisdom of this world for anything. Because it will constantly lead you astray. The wisdom of this world today is that you matter more than anything else. What you want matters. How you feel matters. Where you want to go matters. In fact, that's all that matters. You are the God of your own little world. So just do whatever you want to do. No matter what anything else in this world says, you just do whatever you want to do. And we see that and we think of like uh, the like transgender stuff that's going on. We think of the uh, breakdown of the traditional you know, values in our country. But we need to understand that we do the same thing. We look at the values and the traditions and the philosophy and the wisdom of this world and we build our lives right there along with it. We do all of this. And what Paul is warning us, what I'm warning you, what Jesus is warning you today is don't let your life be guided by anything other than Christ. The way that he says this is really cool. Uh, See to it that no one takes you captive. What does it mean to be taken captive? If I, if I came in here next Sunday morning and I had a net, <laughs> have y'all ever seen the net guns that people have? It looks like a big flashlight and it has a net that's inside of it. And I could shoot it at Chuck and it would wrap him up in a net. It's really cool. You should look it up. Uh, I want one just for my kids. Uh, if I could get them all running in one direction, I could hit them and, you know, done. Um, but they have this new one that's a bolo that goes around your legs. It's even cooler. But uh, if I came in, Next Sunday, and I had this net gun, and y'all are like, well, why you got that crazy look in your eye? I'm like, I'm about to take somebody captive. And you all jumped up and took off running, but Adam, you know, he was trying to take care of other people, so he was being kind, and I hit him with that net gun at the last minute, and y'all are all running out, and I grab the net, and I go back this way, and I'm like, hey, you're, you're going to work at my house now. Like, I've taken him captive, right? It would be an odd thing. I know that that's a crazy, like, scenario to even think through. But that's this thought. He's saying, don't be taken captive. Don't be put this stuff around you. He says, you are Christ. You're rooted in him. You're built up. You're established in him. Don't let anything else take you captive. He even goes and reiterates that at the end of this. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. He's saying, don't be taken captive by anything here, but be taken captive by Christ. Let him take you. Let him be in control. Let him be the boss. Because if we call him Lord, that is what we are saying. You are my Lord and my master. You are in charge. You are in control. I am your captive. I'm the slave of Christ. The funny thing gets in when we start trying to take care of stuff on our own. We start putting a little bit of what we like mixed in with what we think Jesus says. There's no room for that. There's no room for us trying to grab the wheel and steer it where we want to go.
What Paul is trying to make us understand is that as you are alive in Christ, you're dead to this world. It's all about Christ. I think I've probably said that. I don't think I spend too many times, but it's been a lot. I don't think you could say that too many times. This life that we have, it is all about Christ. It is everything of Him. And if we stop and take inventory of our lives, if we start looking through the storehouses of who we are, there's a lot that we need to cast out. We had a, a dumpster at a certain bay over at one of the uh, warehouses I worked at. And when you had a broken item, you just went over there to that uh, wall and you pulled up the thing and chucked it over in the dumpster. It was one of the nastiest things I've ever seen in my life. I mean, honestly, you put like five gallons of spaghetti sauce in there one day and then, you know, pickles and cat food and just all kinds of stuff in this dumpster, in the Florida sun. Like, it did not smell lovely. And the truth of our life is as we discover these things where we're holding on to ourselves, where we're taken captive by some philosoph philosophical pursuit in this life, it's not to say, oh, that sounds cool. I like it. It feels good. It makes me happy. He's saying, take it and cut it out and throw it in the dumpster. Get rid of it. Destroy it. We are to be those that walk in this life with a machete trying to cut the things out of our lives that we know we know are not of Christ. The Holy Spirit reveals it to us. That's the rest of our lives. That's why we say, like, this isn't a one-time thing where you just learn some stuff and then move on. This isn't, you add a little bit of Jesus into your life and then you keep going. This isn't, well, I like Jesus, but I like all this stuff too. This is Jesus is everything. Jesus is all, complete, whole. He has overturned everything in my life and now it is his. He has ransomed me. He is my Lord. He is my master. Where he says to go, I go. Where he says not to go, I don't go. So the question for all of us, and we'll, this is what we'll end with today, is that the life that we're leading? And I know none of us can just be like, yep, peace out, pastor. Uh, none of us can truly say that, right? None of us will be like, yeah, I got it down. I, I'm psh, No big deal. So what do we do about it? What do we do? What do we do tomorrow or, or today when we get home? What are the concrete steps that we take to change how we live our lives? Not just so we can sin less. Not just so that we quit doing some bad habits. This isn't behavior modification. But what is it that we do to be more in line with Him? What is it that we do so that we make ourselves more free to follow Him no matter what it is? We take some of those tent stakes that we've talked about before and we loosen them up. What are those things? Because they're going to be different in your life than they are in my life. It's different for all of us. What is it that we are hanging on to tooth and nail and afraid to let go of? And they're not always bad things. Some of them are traditions. Some of them are philosophies. Some of them are financial. Some of them are security. What is it? And how are you going to get rid of it? How are you going to dump it? The idea is, if we're taken captive by Christ, captives don't have any say. They don't get to drive. You don't see people taking over a village, like storming the village, putting them in nets. That's just how my brain works. And they're like, hey, where do you guys want to go? Y'all feel like going pizza? Yeah. Are we happy? No. They say, you are the, I'm your master now. You do what I say. That's this idea of a relationship that we have with Christ. He is our master. He is our Lord. It's not Jesus is my co-pilot. It's Jesus is driving the ship. I'm just hanging out. 
I'm in the back seat. He's taking me where I need to go. He's doing the things that I need to be doing. Let's follow him closer. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you once again for allowing us to to be yours. Lord, I I thank you that we can be uh, set free from the the bondage of this world. (coughs) Lord, that you have paid our debt, that you have made us free. Lord, that you've given us the ability now, the freedom to choose to be taken captive by you. To choose you as our master. Lord, I just thank you for that. Lord, I pray that as we leave this place today, Lord, that you would, uh, through your Holy Spirit, you would reveal the things in our life, Lord, that we need to dump, that we need to get rid of, Lord, that we need to loosen the, the tense stakes on and, Lord, be more prepared to follow you. I just thank you for who you are. I praise you for who you are. It's in your name, in the name of Jesus, amen.